Halo Mbak Erwina. Iya Bu, halo. Halo, ini temennya siapa lagi temanmu Mbak? Yang panitia? Nanda, Kalisa sama Rio Bu. Nanda itu tulis apa? Nama lengkapnya siapa sih? Si? Ananda Winata. Saya si tak bantu, tak jadiin kok host ya. Iya. Pak Ananda Winata ini tak? Iya. Si, si. Udah tak kok host ya Mbak? Iya Bu. Siapa lagi temanmu? Kalisa Kania. Kalisa Kania. Oke. Terus? Reihan Aryo. Uh, itu Bu. Aryo masih telat datangnya, jadi nggak sekarang Bu. Oh ya ya. Oke. Si, nanti lihatin ya. Kalau temanmu sudah ada ya, cekin ya. Iya Bu. Iya Bu. Terima kasih.
Assalamualaikum, Mbak. Waalaikumsalam. Iya, Wi. Iya, Mbak ini di approve sekarang atau nanti ya? Pesertanya. Sembarang. Biasanya 915 ya. Iya. Sik sik bentar lagi. Ini Bapak ya belum datang ya. Mm -mm. Yang muter video siapa? Saya, Bu. Oh, ya wis. Sudah siap, Kak? Sudah, Bu. Ya wis, kalau sudah siap enggak apa-apa, Wi. Oke, okay, Mbak. Di Ervina, Dek Kalisa sekarang ya kita ya. Iya, Bu. Oke. Okay. Putar sekarang ya, Bu. Iya, iya. Nah, kalau sudah ada yang masuk aja. Oke, okay, Bu. Selamat datang di Fakultas Ekonomi dan Bisnis Universitas Erlangga. Dengan visi menjadi Fakultas Ekonomi dan Bisnis yang mandiri, inovatif, dan berkelas dunia berdasarkan moral dan agama, serta tiga misi pendukung. Fakultas Ekonomi dan Bisnis Universitas Erlangga telah terakreditasi secara nasional dan internasional, tersertifikasi AUN, terakreditasi ABS 21. menjawab kebutuhan perkembangan ekonomi dan bisnis dunia, serta jumlah mahasiswa yang terus meningkat. Kami menghadirkan tenaga pengajar yang kompeten. Fakultas Ekonomi dan Bisnis Universitas Erlangga dipimpin oleh Dekan dan tiga Wakil Dekan. dan juga dilengkapi dengan fasilitas terbaik. Saat ini Fakultas Ekonomi dan Bisnis Universitas Erlangga memiliki empat departemen, yaitu Departemen Ilmu Ekonomi yang telah terakreditasi A, baik sarjana, magister, dan doktor dengan peluang profesi sebagai berikut. Departemen Akuntansi yang telah terakreditasi A baik sarjana, magister, dan doktor serta memiliki program profesi dengan peluang profesi sebagai berikut. Departemen Manajemen yang telah terakreditasi A, baik sarjana, magister, dan doktor. Dengan peluang profesi sebagai berikut. Departemen Ekonomi Syariah. 
yang telah terakreditasi A, baik sarjana, magister, dan doktor. Dengan peluang profesi sebagai berikut. Kami juga memfasilitasi program sarjana internasional. Serta program akselerasi bagi mahasiswa yang memiliki potensi dan prestasi. Melalui Fast Track, Combined Degree, Fast Track dan Combined Degree. Fakultas Ekonomi dan Bisnis Universitas Erlangga juga memberikan program kerjasama internasional untuk meningkatkan kapasitas mahasiswa dan tenaga pengajar meliputi pertukaran mahasiswa, Pertukaran tenaga pengajar Nota kesepahaman atau MOU Riset bersama Gelar ganda Transfer kredit Ajun Profesor dan Amerta serta puluhan program beasiswa. Fakultas Ekonomi dan Bisnis Universitas Erlangga telah menjalin kemitraan domestik dan mancanegara yang bergerak di berbagai sektor bisnis. Berbagai penghargaan internasional telah berhasil diraih demi terwujudnya visi dan misi. Mari bergabung bersama Fakultas Ekonomi dan Bisnis Universitas Erlangga. Raih mimpimu dan wujudkan masa depan cerah. Selamat datang di Fakultas Ekonomi dan Bisnis Universitas Erlangga. Dengan visi menjadi Fakultas Ekonomi dan Bisnis yang mandiri, inovatif, dan berkelas dunia berdasarkan moral dan agama, serta tiga misi pendukung. Fakultas Ekonomi dan Bisnis Universitas Erlangga telah terakreditasi secara nasional dan internasional, tersertifikasi AUN, terakreditasi ABS 21.
untuk menjawab kebutuhan perkembangan ekonomi dan bisnis dunia, serta jumlah mahasiswa yang terus meningkat. Kami menghadirkan tenaga pengajar yang kompeten. Fakultas Ekonomi dan Bisnis Universitas Erlangga dipimpin oleh Dekan dan tiga Wakil Dekan. Dan juga dilengkapi dengan fasilitas terbaik. Saat ini Fakultas Ekonomi dan Bisnis Universitas Erlangga memiliki empat departemen, yaitu Departemen Ilmu Ekonomi yang telah terakreditasi A, baik sarjana, magister, dan doktor dengan peluang profesi sebagai berikut. Departemen Akuntansi yang telah terakreditasi A, baik sarjana, magister, dan doktor, serta memiliki program profesi. Dengan peluang profesi sebagai berikut. Departemen Manajemen yang telah terakreditasi A, baik sarjana, magister, dan doktor. Dengan peluang profesi sebagai berikut. Departemen Ekonomi Syariah Yang telah terakreditasi A, baik sarjana, magister, dan doktor. Dengan peluang profesi sebagai berikut. Kami juga memfasilitasi program sarjana internasional serta program akselerasi bagi mahasiswa yang memiliki potensi dan prestasi. Melalui Fast Track, Combined Degree, Fast Track dan Combined Degree, Fakultas Ekonomi dan Bisnis Universitas Erlangga juga memberikan program kerjasama internasional untuk meningkatkan kapasitas mahasiswa dan tenaga pengajar meliputi pertukaran mahasiswa, Pertukaran tenaga pengajar Nota kesepahaman atau MOU Oke, okay. uh, okay. good morning everyone and good morning David. Hi David. Good morning, thank you very much for uh, your invitation. Yes, we are very fortunate to have you here. Thank you for your time and your, uh, your time to share with us today. Okay, on behalf of the Department of Accounting, uh, welcome to our fifth guest lecture and today also the last session of our lecture and today's topic is about professional skepticism in public sector finance, governance and audit. And we have an uh, excellent speaker, Prof. David Gilchrist from the University of Western Australia. 
and I'm Dina Hariati, the host of today's event. I'm very excited to have you all here and also joining us today also our Secretary of Department, Ibu Nadi Anrido. Good morning, Ibu. And again, I'm more than excited to welcome Prof. David. How are you, Prof? I'm very well, thank you for asking. I'm very cold and wet and windy here in Perth, unfortunately. Yes, I believe it's winter season in Australia, right? Indeed, indeed. And we, but it's not usually this cold in Perth. So um, I feel uh, I feel jealous of your warm weather. No, actually not. Surabaya today huh? is, is quite cold. It's quite cloudy today in Surabaya. I'm sorry to hear that. I yes, hope that's not my The average influence. temperature is 30 degrees and now it's below 30. So, oh, crikey. Yeah, we have, yeah, yeah. Well, um, okay. I hope it's not my influence bringing the weather. <laughs> no, no, of course not. Okay, um, David, thank you again for uh, attending this event. And uh, I, will, I would like to introduce uh, a bit about Prof. David, but if you go through the CV, it's a quite long list, so it's a very short introduction. Let me share the screen. Okay, uh, so as we know that Prof. David is professor at the University of Western Australia, and he also held a number of senior roles. Of course, he, aside of the academia, he also a, a practitioner and has research in the areas of nonprofit sustainability, economics, and governance, and has written over 100 uh, industry reports and has numerous publications, of course, as well. And I would like to also mention that he's the one who developed the first national report on charities in Australia and established the Curtin Not for Profit Initiative in uh, 2011. And I'm sure David is a right person to ask uh, regarding the non-for-profit sector and uh, yeah. public sector. Okay, um, I also want to remind you about our rules. Okay, and the guest lecture is being recorded and live streamed. And please stay muted until called upon and turn on your camera and use the uh, virtual background. And for the Q&A process, send your question through the slide do feature. Just uh, visit the, uh, the link and enter the code number GL05 and uh, David will try to get it. Okay, and I wish you enjoy the guest lecture. I believe everyone is excited to hear the lecture, David. Okay, uh, well, over to you, David. Thank you very much. Um, I can't share my screen. Can you make it so oh, that yes, I can? Yes, of course. Thank I'll you. stop the screen. Thank you. Can everyone see that okay now? Yes, yes. All good, David. All good. Fantastic. Oh, well, look, thank you very much. And thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, I really appreciate it. Of course, recognising that um, all of the papers and all of the work that's been done is a reflection probably more of my age than anything else. Um, so as you get to my my uh, time in life, you, you are looking at um, or sitting on a lot of material. So um, at least I hope that material is useful in terms of this uh, discussion. Um, I'm also really pleased to have the opportunity to speak uh, and hopefully to encourage, I guess, two things. One, some um, uh, further uh, research into professional scepticism. It's an area that is absolutely critical in the context of accounting, auditing, uh, governance, as we all know, uh, and even general management. It's a really important aspect. And so to that extent, I'd love to be able to uh, talk with people, not only about the contents of this session, but also about what kinds of research people might be uh, might like to do together or um, to give some ideas about what kind of research might be useful uh, going forward. So please uh, give that some thought as well. The second thing that I would like to say is, and um, quite right, I'm very happy to uh, uh, take questions and in fact what I thought we would do is I would talk for about 45 minutes if that works for everybody and then we can have 15 minutes or so for um, uh, discussion afterwards and I'm also not only uh, am I keen to get questions but I'm sure there's people in the audience with a lot of experience 
and a lot of capacity. And I would love to get your opinions as well as your questions. So um, I'm, I might be getting on a bit in age, but I'm certainly very happy to learn from my colleagues. So I'd be delighted to, to hear. Um, the third thing I would say is that this presentation is not a uh, research presentation per se. What I've tried to do, I guess, is to bring some key ideas uh, in the context of professional scepticism and public sector and uh, audit. Uh, with a view to uh, exploring where the weaknesses are and perhaps just engaging in a first discussion. Uh, and to that extent, I guess the final point I'd like to make before I get into it is that I'd be delighted to present more fully on specific areas of research in future sessions, if that's something that uh, the university uh, would find useful uh, and certainly very happy to, to discuss that going forward. So my title today is Professional Scepticism in the Public Sector Finance Governance and Audit. And as um, I, in my introduction was pointed out, my fundamentally my work has been around not-for-profits, whether public sector or private not-for-profit organisations. And it has been uh, fundamentally um, focused in the Australian context, but certainly increasingly across the region. And so I'm excited, as I say, to learn about uh, Indonesian perspectives on this topic, as well as to be able to give you my, my sense of it too. Um, and so to that extent, in terms of my agenda for today, I'd like to just have a brief discussion of key definitions. And I think the key definitions are really important because professional scepticism is something that is, if you like, intellectually understood, but not necessarily enculturated or um, uh, felt by people that are practicing it. And unfortunately, one of the key elements of professional scepticism is, of course, the more experienced you are, the more you have seen of the world, then the much more effective professional skeptic you are. So I want to talk about definitions, but perhaps also talk about some of the, uh, the challenges in relation to that uh, idea as well. I want to have a look at some of the risks that are posed in public sector and uh, in the audit environment in the context of uh, professional scepticism and look at what those risks uh, and might be and what kinds of things practitioners might consider or look for or um, use as red flags in the context of their work. And so to a fair degree, a lot of my work is focused on uh, the practical implementation of the kinds of things that we research. And so this presentation is very much, um, I hope, about the practical side of uh, managing and uh, delineating, deploying uh, professional scepticism. I'll have a look at some of the pressures and signs that uh, practitioners should be thinking about in the context of professional scepticism and think more broadly about how it might be that you uh, as a practitioner can consider how you might um, develop your uh, working papers or develop your uh, process uh, maps and things of that nature in order to be able to have triggers for professional scepticism in your mind going forward. And then finally, of course, I want to look at the limitations around professional scepticism and the kinds of things that I think are really important for people to realise. I guess one of the key limitations, and I want to get this uh, up front, is of course, as I mentioned before, that issue of experience. But the other key limitation is that we're all humans and humans of course have their strengths and their weaknesses, and we all carry those strengths and weaknesses. So there are potential cultural limitations that impact the way professional scepticism might be deployed by an individual within a firm, within a government department or more broadly. And I'll touch on those kinds of limitations as we go through the presentation rather than waiting for the last minute. But I guess, it, guess for me, it's really important to keep in mind uh, the humanity around accounting and auditing, the humanity around governance and financial management, um, and the context that as much as we like to think of accounting as being often a scientific and objective uh, pursuit, in reality, accounting is a very subjective and uh, subject particularly to the human foibles, to the human weaknesses. And so to that extent, I think it's really important to consider professional scepticism in that context. The other thing that I might do, and I, as I go through a presentation, traditionally I say these are red flags or these are things that I think really need to be emphasised. One of the other things that might be worth emphasising here is that not only is professional scepticism, of course, an important tool to deploy, but it's equally important, and I haven't covered this off to a great deal because I think it's probably a, a more substantive additional topic, um, but of course, when we deploy professional scepticism, that is when we, we're thinking about a particular problem or an issue, or we feel 
uh, the less confident about information were pro um, being provided or the prospects of a company or a government, a government agency, uh, then we also need to work out how we are going to communicate that professional scepticism to those people that we might be auditing, working with, or who might be subject to our concerns. And I think this is also a really important issue. As I say, it's not covered fully in this particular topic, but I do think it's something for those people that are watching this presentation to perhaps sit back and think about in the context of um, the kinds of things I'm going to be talking about. There's no point in being a professional skeptic, being right, but also being aggressive, for instance, in terms of your response to people, because of course, that means that at the end of the day, that there is a real uh, challenge in relation to how those people absorb the response of that professional scepticism and how they, they respond themselves. So I guess the other thing that I'd like to do as I go along is, and again, you might care to jot these things down, uh, is to highlight where there are some opportunities, I think, for research. And certainly the enculturation of the results of professional scepticism are a big area for research going forward. The behavioural response to accountants, auditors and others uh, challenging um, how people um, pro produce information, what their motives for producing that information might be, etc. And so I think that is an area where there is a real need for ongoing research because behavioural accounting um, and behavioural economics of which, in my opinion, behavioural accounting is a subset, um, then you will see uh, is a really important issue. And I think the cultural differences, for instance, between Indonesia and Australia may mean that some of the things that I say are just not applicable in your world. And likewise, the kind of research you might identify and the findings you might identify might be different to mine. So I guess not only are there research gaps, but there are also cultural gaps that very, very heavily impact the um, professional scepticism itself, how it's practiced, and also how those people who are subject to that pro uh, professional scepticism respond uh, to, the, uh, to the outcomes. Okay, and then finally, as I said, we'll be uh, very keen to have some questions and, uh, and uh, to be able to chat with people uh, at the 45 minute mark. I'm really happy to, to go through anything. Um, so first and foremost, professional scepticism is a subset of what we might call the fundamental principles of professional ethics. And I think probably everyone that's in this meeting would be well aware of these components of professional ethics, but at the same time, it's probably worth just touching on them to make sure that we're all on the same page and we understand how professional scepticism is an ethical responsibility uh, to hold an attitude of uh, professional scepticism. It's not something that you might choose to do or that's something that you might uh, have a um, personal uh, enjoyment in, in pursuing, so to speak but it's actually something that's expected of you as a professional accountant, accountant in the context of professional ethics. So fundamental principles of professional ethics is I'm sure, as I say, you all know, include maintaining integrity, maintaining objectivity, professional competence and due care. So understanding what you're doing and making sure you do it properly. Confidentiality, so you're not going out and telling the world what the kinds of things you find in audits and so on. And also professional behaviour generally, making sure that you're always acting professionally in the context of the work that you're undertaking. I'd put it to you, and I'm really happy to, to chat about this more, that professional scepticism is a subset of each one of those professional ethical principles. So that you're only able to be have integrity if you're actually identifying what's really happening and you're prepared to speak about what's really happening. You can only demonstrate objectivity if you're actually using your professional scepticism to make sure that the kind of information that you're looking at is going to be uh, the truest information possible, that, that it actually adds up and makes sense. What we call in Australia, triangulating that information. So being able to get different bits of information and compare them in order to be able to say, yes, likely that that information provided is true. Professional competence and due care. Professional competence includes knowing your business and knowing your work, but it also includes making sure that you're asking the right questions. So one thing about being professional and particularly about exercising professional ethics in my mind is that not only do you need to understand what you're doing, but you also have to understand the limitations of your capacity, your experience and your knowledge. You need to understand when to ask further questions, when to seek further information. And that's part of that due care element. That is, we don't come out of 
grad school, all knowing everything, being all, all seeing and all knowing, we actually have to go through experience and we graduate uh, through our careers and gradually become more competent at what we do. But at the end of the day, there's a real need for us to make sure that we're asking questions as much as we are providing answers. Confidentiality, of course, is critical, and that comes back to that accounting behavioural response in relation to professional scepticism that I talked about before, as does professional behaviour. Let's have a look a little more deeply. First of all, expertise, professional judgment and professional scepticism go hand in hand in my mind. And I think this is a really important part of the definitional process, if you like, for want of a better term. When we talk about professional judgment, typically we think about something that involves or an action, a process that involves the application of relevant training, knowledge and experience in making informed decisions about appropriate courses of action. I don't think this is a definition that most people in the room would argue with, but what I would say is that in relation to this uh, definition, this extends or should be extended in my mind to also recognising where you don't have the skills, experience, competence, or where you need to ask questions. And professional scepticism in my mind is very much linked to your questioning mind. That is, it's not just about what you know and what you take for granted, but it's actually about testing yourself and testing that what you're looking at is actually making sense. And so to that extent, I think professional judgment um, or rather professional scepticism is a subset of professional judgment. And that is an attitude that includes a questioning mind, being alert to conditions indicating possible misstatement. So in the case of audit particularly, but also in terms of fraud and other things. So critically assessing the audit evidence or the evidence that were being provided. Now, it's hard to, in one sense, it's hard to describe or talk about professional skepticism in audit and in general management, in general financial governance. But in another sense, it's not. When I talk about evidence in this presentation, I'm talking about audit evidence, but there's also evidence provided by your colleagues, your co-workers and other sources that when you are involved in financial governance of an organisation, you're able to um, manage and use and to assess. And so evidence to my mind is really about what kind of documentation, what kind of information, data you're examining and your perspective on that data. So that professional judgment involves the application of relevant training, knowledge, experience, making informed decisions. Professional scepticism is that part of professional judgment that drives our thirst for knowledge, but also drives our um, capacity to be able to say whether or not we think this passes the, the taste test, uh, which is a phrase we use in Australia. In other words, if we spoke to our friends about this particular problem, would they think that this is this makes sense or it doesn't make sense? Would it make uh, would it be logical or would it not be logical? So to me, professional skepticism is certainly an attitude that includes a questioning mind, being alert to conditions indicating possible misstatement, fraud, and other things. In other words, it's about not taking that information, that data uh, on the face of it. What does that mean then in terms of key definitions? So professional skepticism is about maintaining a questioning mind. So always questioning the kinds of things that are being provided to you and making sure that it makes sense uh, ultimately. Again, we tend to in practice what we do what we call triangulation. We try and get one piece of evidence and we try and compare that to a couple of other pieces of evidence to make sure that that makes sense. It also means not taking things at face value. So just because you say this to me, and just because I might like you or respect you or whatever it happens to be, it doesn't mean that I necessarily take everything that you say as being absolutely correct and true. That doesn't mean, of course, that you're trying to mislead me or to tell me a lie, but it does mean that I need to be aware that we're all human and we all make mistakes and therefore I need to make sure that there is some what we call efficacy in the information that's being provided. In other words, that information is strong uh, and it makes sense. We also need to employ our experience and knowledge effectively. And I mean, mentioned this limitation earlier in my presentation. And that is at the end of the day, uh, for good or for bad, the older we get, the more experience we get, the better professional skeptics we become because we've seen more of what goes on. And I think this is an area that's really interesting to me from a research perspective. So the second research topic that I think might be useful to consider for academics at uh, your university is that 
or there's rather two research topics. One of them is how do you effectively teach undergraduate students who typically by definition don't have worlds of experience, they're starting their life, starting their career, how do you give them the knowledge that they need in order to be uh, professionally sceptic or at least um, uh, to be working towards that as they, uh, as they leave university and, and join their first jobs and so on? And then secondly, how do you make sure that you instill that professional efficacy, uh, uh, scepticism so that it's maintained and developed throughout their career? And I think these are two very different things. So giving someone the tools to be a professional skeptic is of course an important thing so that I can go out and practice. But also when I go out and practice as a young accountant, as a young uh, professional person, of course, I'm going to be influenced very heavily by my superiors, by those people that are older than me that have been doing it for longer. And I'm going to find it very difficult to challenge sometimes the things that they might do, uh, regardless of whether I think it's the right thing or not. And I guess that means that this idea of professional scepticism for me is a subset of, of training people in terms of being ethical in their practice and maintaining that ethics. So there's two really important research areas there, I think. One, as I say, is how do you actually pass over that experience that's been accumulated and, um, and so that people have the tools? And then secondly, how do they have those communication tools? How do you build um, into them those communication tools so that they can continue to act in a skeptical way uh, in an environment where they start off typically at the very bottom rung of the ladder. And therefore they've got to convince upwards on what we call manage upwards in terms of that uh, outcome. I guess the final point then is really for me, professional skepticism is about making sure for yourself. So someone might tell you something, you don't take that at face value. You have to make sure that you are confident that uh, the thing is the way it's been presented. In the Australian context, there are many audit engagements where auditors have subsequently been sued because they haven't made sure for themselves. They've taken their client's word at, 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 for, uh, uh, at gospel. In other words, they've taken their client's word without challenging it or investigating it or ensuring things uh, are the way they've said they've been. And in fact, some of our very significant uh, audit um, uh, failures have been uh, caused as a result of that lack of uh, professional scepticism on the part of the audit partners for those companies. I guess there's a couple of things that professional scepticism is not, and I think I've probably touched on these, but it's important that we get them right as well. First and foremost, it's not being antagonistic. In other words, being a professional skeptic is not about telling people that they're lying or that they're um, um, uh, always going to tell fibs. It's just about having a questioning mind, just making sure that it all adds up all the time. It's not about disrespecting the client or disrespecting your colleagues. Uh, it's not about being antagonistic to them. It's also not about being aloof or aggressive. So it's not about using aggressive language. And that goes back to that uh, element that I talked about before, where I think there's a great research opportunity in terms of the performance uh, performance of professional scepticism and that accounting behaviour, the behavioural responses that come out of the challenge that an auditor or a practising accountant might use in order to um, dispense their, uh, their professional sceptic uh, findings, if you like. Um, and it's not about disbelieving, as I said before. It's really about honestly trying to make sure that you feel comfortable with the evidence being put, regardless of the work that you're doing. So to that extent, it is part of being professional, it is part of acting ethically, and it is important for you and your colleagues to understand professional scepticism. And I guess this is a, an important aspect as well. And so the fourth research topic that I think might be useful uh, is in the context of professional scepticism within the accounting teaching framework. And so why, why do I say that? Because I think that accounting lecturers are always um, uh, encountering uh, students and student responses to assessments in various forms. So they can be oral, written, uh, they can be presentations and so on and so forth. A position of professional scepticism, I think is a really important aspect and perhaps a good example of how that's deployed in the context of student uh, capacity as well. In other words, making sure students are actually doing the right thing in the context of those assessments and that everything that they're providing you adds up in the same way as you might do when you're out in practice as well. 
So professional scepticism also relies on, of course, the understanding of an entity and its environment. This is an enduring challenge in auditing particularly, but it's also enduring in the context of financial government in public sector agencies. In terms of auditing, it's an enduring problem because it's very hard to understand the culture of an organisation for two reasons. One, the auditor is not there all the time, as we know. But secondly, of course, the auditee, the client, is trying to present to the auditor a picture of capacity and substance that might be different to reality. And the auditor has to be able to work their way through that. And so professional scepticism relies on your understanding of that entity and environment and how important that is in the context of um, auditing process particularly. What I would say is, I think there is a great opportunity for research globally in the context of um, that aspect of audit in understanding your environment and the entity itself. In schematic terms, so in black and white terms, we can understand what the organisation chart is, we can understand what the flow diagram might be for um, controls and so on. But at the end of the day, actually understanding the culture of the entity is a, a very great challenge for auditors. And I think there's a great opportunity for research in that context as well. Your assessment of business risk and inherent risk is also an absolutely critical element of professional scepticism, both in the context of undertaking audit and in the context of financial governance in public sector agencies. So the assessment of business risk and inherent risk in the context of public sector agencies is really understanding what the motivations and drivers might be for those people providing information that may not um, uh, be providing the right information or might be presenting it in such a way as to give a different story or to lead you to make a different decision that you might have made otherwise. So that assessment of business risk and inherent risk is a really critical part of maintaining that professional scepticism. But so too is materiality. And I think I'll talk to materiality a little bit over the coming couple of slides, but materiality is a really important aspect as well, because when we deploy our professional scepticism and we actually respond to what clients or colleagues provide us in terms of information or evidence, we need to ensure that we're alighting on and focusing on the material issues, the material cultural or other issues that might impact the efficacy of that data. And rather than simply looking at some of the, um, the little issues that might be wrong as a result of a, a human error or something else. I'll talk to that a little bit more in a, in a tick. Um, and so, of course, experience gained from previous situations is the critical one. And that goes back to that research subject that I suggested was important before. How do you get those experiences across in the classroom to people who are young and starting their career that don't have the world experience that people such as yourselves as lecturers and others uh, tend to have? The source and reliability of information available is also a really important area of professional scepticism. Those auditing academics in the room would be well aware that um, there is a hierarchy of uh, preference in terms of the source of information. That is information that's provided by somebody or some company outside of an audit client is always looked as being much more important and much more uh, at higher efficacy than those pieces of information that are developed by the client. Whereas the auditor's self-developed information sits in between those two. So at the end of the day, the source and reliability of information availability is also a really critical aspect of professional scepticism and how that works. And I guess it, uh, uh, one of the, the key issues is, of course, fraud often uh, is uh, perpetrated and um, is uh, not identified initially because, of course, that internal information is being doctored to present a particular picture, uh, which is the substance of the fraud that's being investigated. So. Suasiveness of information is also a really critical aspect here. And all of those elements go into determining whether or not that information is persuasive. Another way to look at professional scepticism is whether or not what is being provided to you, said to you, presented to you, is actually persuasive from your perspective. That is, does it really make me feel comfortable and am I able to appreciate uh, and feel uh, that this is a strong piece of evidence? Again, the research area, I think, is really critical around this, this material. And I think that uh, different national cultural differences 
make a big difference to what the prospective outcome of that research might be. And so I suggest that there is a real opportunity for further research around the efficacy of information and how comfortable auditors and other people feel when they're, um, they're uh, faced by uh, information provided by clients, for instance. Um, and of course, the research key research question is, how do we judge that efficacy or that level of comfort? And how do we raise that level of comfort uh, in our audit or other processes? The other element that is important here is that um, there are some resources, of course, and the first set of resources is the International Auditing Standards, Paris A18 to A22, which gives some discussion or some commentary around uh, deploying professional scepticism in the context of audit. My enduring opinion has been that auditing standards and accounting standards, particularly the examples, are very good, obviously, for practitioners, but they're also very good for those people that might be wanting to find some information examples or commentary in relation to particular issues. It is interesting to me that there is a very, uh, while there are um, four paragraphs there on professional scepticism, um, there's a very really a limited commentary in the auditing standards in relation to that. And so one of the things that might also be useful is um, some research in which I'd, I'd would like to talk to people about is some research around um, strategies and um, tools for assessing professional scepticism in the workplace, so applying it in the workplace, particularly from an audit perspective. Um, there is some commentary in the auditing standards around professional scepticism, but I guess how do you make that into a practitioner, practitioner's tool rather than commentary saying essentially how difficult it is to be able to define and to deploy. Business press is also a really good um, source there and particularly history. History is a great indicator of uh, what kinds of things have happened in the past and often those things happen um, going forward as well as we know. One of the things that came out of the um, financial crisis, the GFC, was that a number of senior universities, uh, particularly in the US that teach uh, economics, um, so substantially teach economics, um, examined their offerings uh, in the context of why the GFC occurred and particularly because a lot of their um, graduates were leading their banks and leading the, the, the uh, organisations that didn't do very well. And they really landed on the fact that they've taken history out of the economics uh, curricula. And that history, I think, is just as important for accounting students as well, because it actually helps people to contextualise, understand and actually see the real world happening, even though, of course, it's happened before it's not happening in front of them. One of the key things that you learn, again, uh, if I'm not pressing the point in relation to my age too much, uh, one of the key things that you do learn as you get older is that things go cycle, cyclically, they go around in circles. And so the kinds of things we've seen before are very likely to happen again. And so very good for reinforcing that professional scepticism. And so information, of course, is fundamentally the the toolbox or the, the working area for accountants, uh, regardless of the occupation that they're operating in. And of course, the reliability information in terms of its influence uh, by nature and source is a really critical thing to be thinking about in this context as well. So resources, uh, sources rather from outside the entity are absolutely re more reliable, as I mentioned before. Information generated internally is more reliable uh, than uh, when the internal control structures are effective. So, I guess why I've got this second point is that because we've got to look at not only what people are telling us, but what the environment is in which they're telling us. And that environment extends to not just those control environments, but also what is the culture of the organisation and particularly the managers, the leaders, how ethical do you think they are? How focused do you think they are on the things that need to be done? And how, particularly how they need to be done. And then of course, information is obtained directly is more reliable than that evidence obtained elsewhere. Information in the form of documents or written representation is more reliable than oral presentations. One of the research areas that I think there needs to be some more work on uh, relates to those oral presentations and the fact that as auditors particularly rely very heavily on discussions with people uh, about how um, the organisation's running, uh, issues around going concern, what the strategy might be and so on and so forth. I think there is an opportunity for research around the topic of 
those oral representations and how auditors might conduct their discussions more effectively in order to be able to apply that professional scepticism and to, to be able to determine um, uh, what, uh, whether or not there's efficacy and what people are telling them. And then of course, information provided by original documents is more reliable than evidence provided by photocopies or facsimiles and those kinds of things. All important reliability of information, but all of these dot points also indicate a level of professional scepticism being employed or considered so that when you get a, a photocopy document or a facsimile document, you should be more skeptical about the contents of that document than if you get something printed straight off the report structure of a IT system within say a, an audit client. Coming back to materiality, I said I would touch on that first and foremost uh, a little while ago. And I wanted to, to say first and foremost, of course, when we talk about materiality, and again, these things wouldn't be new to many people in this, uh, in this presentation, but materiality, of course, is generally focused on um, from a quantitative perspective. That is typically we describe materiality as a percentage of a relevant base, whatever that might be. And anything that's less than that relevant base, we tend not to concern ourselves uh, in the context of materiality. In other words, it just doesn't matter. I think though that qualitative materiality is a really important element in the context, particularly of government reporting, but certainly from an audit perspective as well. And I don't think this is an area that's had as much airing and as much discussion as quantitative materiality has. And certainly in the Australian scene and in the um, Anglophone world, uh, I think it's fair to say that we focus very much on quantitative materiality because auditing really focuses us, uh, us down that risk-based process. Um, but when we think about government, actually qualitative materiality is a really important thing. That is that qualitative materiality is an assessment of materiality that doesn't necessarily look at the size of the amount involved or the size of the, um, uh, the issue in dollar terms or in quantity terms, but it actually looks at it more in cultural terms. And why I say that's important from a governance perspective in, in public sector is because of course, if we have a private company and a private company's managing director takes a hundred um, dollars in Australian terms uh, out of petty cash and goes to the movies, um, it's not acceptable, but it's not going to make the front pages of the paper. No one's going to care because it's only $100 and it doesn't make any difference. But if a minister did that, if a public servant did that, then there would be a different cultural response to that particular issue. It's not the $100, it's the behaviour that is the qualitative materiality issue. And if someone's prepared to undertake that behaviour, what other behaviour are they prepared to pursue? Again, I don't think there's been a lot of work around qualitative materiality uh, in the public sector particularly, and I think there's a great opportunity there to do some work uh, in the research stakes, but extending that, I think that there's opportunity from a country by country perspective as well, because of course, there are cultural differences that impact our sense of that what is qualitatively material. Uh, and my example, for instance, might be important in Australia that the, um, the um, minister doesn't take $100 out of the petty cash tin, but in another country, it might not be an issue at all because there's cultural variation there that, and expectations. So I think that materiality element is really important. Those qualitative factors then in materiality include things like the significance of the item to the particular entity. Um, they include the expectations of the community about behaviour of public figures, as we said before, and perhaps there's an opportunity for us to do research that looks at what that, that um, um, public think as being a particularly qualitatively material issue. So I might say $100 spent by the minister going to the movies is bad in Australia, but my, um, my fellow Australians might not feel that that's an issue at all. Uh, I suspect otherwise, but you never know um, how people will react. Um, so I guess there's then a group of signs that also need to be tested and thought through in the context of all of those research suggestions that I made before and in the context of this idea of professional scepticism. And I want to run through them um, fairly quickly because we've got um, uh, about um, uh, five or six minutes left, I think, before we get to, uh, to discussion. But I understand, Dina, we can go a little bit further if we need to. 
So indicators and signs in terms of integrity of management, the kinds of things that we might look to include reputation, prior disputes, legal issues, limitation to access to records, and pressure to reduce fees are all things that typically in the auditing world, we would consider to be indicators of uh, either integrity or a lack of integrity, depending on your perspective. Of course, we've always got to be balanced just because there's been legal issues, for instance, in a company's um, uh, history, doesn't mean that it's always done something wrong or in indeed those legal issues might not be relevant to that company having done the wrong thing. But these are the kinds of things that we need to look at and perhaps are the kinds of things that you start to then research around to understand people's cultural responses uh, to this professional scepticism issue that I talked about before. Management experience, knowledge and changes during the period are also things that we should talk about. So things like poor business decisions, inappropriate accounting policies, lack of proper review, lack of proper, proper internal controls, all of these things will increase your professional scepticism and your sceptical response to data and evidence that's provided to you because you feel that the background, you're, you're less comfortable in relation to the culture of the organisation and how it operates. But there can also be some unusual pressures on management as well. So remunerations linked to performance, typically not an issue in the public sector, but certainly an issue in the private sector where uh, those charged with governance or those um, chief executive officers of organisations are really highly incentivised to pursue or to change reporting or other things in order to get their remuneration to make sure they get paid as fully as they can. They meet or beat analysis forecast, I think is also a really important issue, impacts on share prices and so on. In the public sector, these kinds of unusual pressures might manifest in a number of ways, but they typically sneak up on organisations. They're less obvious, perhaps. One of the things, for, for instance, that often happens in public sector, certainly in Australia, I suspect it'll be the same in Indonesia, but I'm really happy to discuss it as well. And that is that when you, um, when governments pass legislation, they might provide increasing um, responsibilities or place increasing responsibilities on departments and not actually increase the resources of those departments. In Australia, that happens very regularly where there's a particular problem, whatever that problem might be, government passes a law and says a department will do a particular thing and suddenly the department has more work to do, but it doesn't have more resources to do that work. And so in Australia, we have a thing that we call the hollowing out of the public sector, where the public sector is continually overburdened with work and it's got less and less resources. So it allocates those resources to the outside external facing um, component, but it has less administrative capacity, less auditing, internal auditing capacity, less decision-making capacity and that analysis capacity internally. So why it sneaks up? It sneaks up because perhaps one piece of legislation and one additional task doesn't matter, but over time, those numbers of tasks increase quite dramatically. And again, I think there's a real opportunity for some research in that context as well. So in terms of being professionally sceptical, having an understanding not only of the, the government department itself, but the history of that government department and the key um, uh, attributes of the tasks assigned to it is a really important aspect of uh, auditing and deploying professional scepticism in that context in the public sector environment. So nature of an entity's business, of course, is really important. So susceptibility to technical changes, exposure to commodity prices, all of those kinds of things are really important. But other things that might be important as well, for instance, the sheer size of government agencies can be difficult. Now I'm telling you that from Australia with our small population. In Indonesia, of course, there is a massive uh, government um, uh, pro uh, process and, and uh, many more people employed uh, as a necessity compared to those employed in Australia. And so I think the nature of the entity's business from a public sector perspective is focusing on not just these kinds of issues around how the organisation operates, but again, the cultural and size context make a big difference to your sense of the organisation and how well it operates or otherwise. And of course, all of these things then inform your professional scepticism uh, and how you, uh, how you deploy that. So factors affecting in industry in which the entity operates, competitiveness, regulation, environmental implications, anti-consumer sentiment. Um, my knowledge of Indonesia extends to 
the need for decision making capacity to be devolved into regions, for instance, for a whole lot of reasons, not uh, least of which there's cultural and other diversity from one region to the next in such an, an enormous uh, geographical land as well as a big population. All of those things are, effect, are factors that affect public sector and affect the audit process and our deployment of professional scepticism in that context. Perhaps one of the things that might be really useful there is a comparator between Indonesia or countries like Australia as a federation, and then New Zealand, of course, as a unitary government, uh, but a small unitary government with a, a different cultural background um, can be a really interesting research um, uh, program as well. So going concern indicators, of course, are really critical elements as well. And in fact, in practice, when I was a partner in an um, accounting firm and doing auditing, the financial indicators were the first things that I would look at to make sure going concern was, uh, I felt comfortable about going concern because a lack of uh, capacity as a going concern will change the behavior of everybody in, involved in that organization as I'm sure you would appreciate. So from a skeptic's perspective, we need to think about those financial indicators. We need to think about the operating indicators. And I think from a government perspective, these are really important. So management's intention to seize operations or to change, to do the things that they need to do. What is local management's intention around what kind of tasks are allocated to a particular department or a particular agency? And then of course, other indicators include things like legal proceedings or disasters and so on and so forth. They're all things that you might take into consideration when you're thinking about um, professional scepticism in public sector. The next point is taken, as you can see, from a guide to using the um, international uh, standards on audit. Uh, and you can see the fraud uh, pyramid there, which I'm sure, again, many people in the room are uh, familiar with. This fraud pyramid is an absolutely critical tool in the context of raising not only uh, reviewing fraud as an auditor, and thinking about fraud as a government uh, manager, uh, someone charged with government governance of, uh, of public sector finance, but also thinking as a professional skeptic. If you go back to all of those things that I was talking about before, uh, in terms of information quality, in terms of uh, what kinds of things that you need to think about in the context of moving forward, I think these three things are the first things that uh, auditors and others should be put in, placing in their mind in the context of um, being able to appreciate what's being delivered to them from an informational perspective. So pressure, rationalisation and opportunity are the three key things that must be present in order for a fraud to be perpetrated. Understanding the entity and understanding the environment in which the entity operates is an absolutely critical aspect. And I guess just remembering from a government perspective, Fraud is not just involving the taking of money and using of money for private purposes, but fraud involves using assets for private purposes or unapproved purposes as well. So fraud extends beyond just the protection of the fiscal capacity of the organisation. It also uh, impacts the capacity of the organisation in the context of uh, the use of assets and how those assets are deployed. I mentioned before the limitations, and I think I have sort of gone through those limitations fairly fully as I've gone through the presentation. At the end of the day, the limitations really revolve around the places you can look as an auditor or someone charged with governance in the context of your organisation, where you can go and what you can do. If you like, one of the big challenges that our students have, regardless of, uh, I think, whether they're Indonesian students or Australian students or anyone else, is that because they're coming to a profession with limited life experience, then they have a limited view or horizon in terms of where they can look and what they can do. And I think that makes a, a place as a real challenge on all of us uh, to make sure that we're continually increasing our knowledge of the environment in which we're working, increasing the knowledge uh, that we have around how people react in that particular environment. So understanding people more effectively. And I guess at the end of the day, it really says to me in the context of this pre presentation of professional scepticism, as I said right at the start, that humanity in the context of accounting is an absolutely crucial element. 
we can all learn the technical stuff. We can learn our debits and credits. We can learn the rules. We can learn the laws. But at the end of the day, we're relying on people to implement those things. And we're responding to the way those people implement them and how they react to our professional scepticism. And I think that's a really important aspect as well. So that's all I really wanted to cover off. I think I'm about four minutes over my promised 45 minutes. Uh, but I'd be delighted to take questions or comments um, and always delighted to be um, to, to get other people's opinions and particularly if they're different opinions. Okay, all right. Thank you, David, for your question and sharing. Um, I think we already have a couple of questions here. Um, but before we move into the Q&A, uh, thank you for suggesting some research area uh, in the middle of your presentation. Okay, I uh, already not some of the, uh, what you underline about the cultural factors that affect how we apply our professional skepticism, how we yep. communicate and how we uh, assess the efficacy of information, the response of the uh, audit of, uh, about our professional, professional skepticism. Okay, thank you. And we move into the q and I will share the screen. Uh, can you stop the screen? Right, yeah. There you go. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so um, we have a couple of questions. The first one, what can be done by audit firms and auditors to enhance the awareness? Sorry, of the importance of professional skepticism and its application? I, I think there's two things. One of the things that really worries me in the Australian context is that increasingly firms are reducing the amount of training that they're providing to their staff in order to be, um, uh, in order to, uh, I guess they call it efficiency, but actually to cut costs and to be more profitable. I think there is a real need for um, audit firms to have training, to continue to have their training. But I think the training around case studies is a really important aspect. So when you're young and you're inexperienced, the only way you can absorb experience, if you like, is either by doing things over a period of 20 years or uh, combined with, rather, looking at cases. So this is what happened. This is how it happened. This is why the auditor didn't pick it up or why the accountant didn't pick it up or the board didn't pick it up. And this is what the person did or didn't do. Um, I think case studies are a really good way of um, reinforcing to students why they have to be professionally skeptical. And I guess the other thing I'd say there is of course, um, students uh, and, uh, and junior staff are smart, they get these case studies and they don't even have to be told that they're being professionally skeptical, if you know what I mean. They just need to have an understanding of what the drivers are for that behavior and to apply that. So um, I think it's important, of course, that we talk about professional skepticism with them, but at the end of the day, those cases will show them or demonstrate the, um, the need for looking at these things more uh, completely, if that makes sense. Okay, uh, how about to exercise the professional skepticism at the uh, audit firm's level? Yeah, say when, that again, sorry. Okay, what you mentioned about the training case studies is for undergraduate students, am I yeah. right? Yeah. How, how about we uh, train the auditors when they already enter the audit firms? I think exactly the same way. I think case studies are really important because um, when you're in an audit firm, uh, you can only sort of see um, what you, you, your experience allows you to see. Your boss, your managers um, give you context. I think case studies allow junior people to see a broader perspective of what, what happened and why it went wrong. But also the importance of case studies is, and I think this is really critical opportunity for research as well is that when you're in practice and you're actually doing an audit as we all know typically you're up against the clock you've got to do it within a certain amount of time your client wants it done the stock market or somebody wants there's a deadline um, you don't really have a chance to think on some of the things that the cases might throw up and allow you to discuss in other words it forces the manager to behave in a particular way 
the same as it forces the staff to. Does that make sense? So when you're looking at case studies, the manager's got to think about, well, how do I relate that in practice as well? Okay, cool. Thank you, David. Uh, the second is how can the application of professional skepticism be evident? This is a really big research question, I think. Um, and I've, um, so when I was um, Auditor General here, um, I reviewed many, many audit files and many people pertain, uh, uh, maintained that they, many auditors knew their uh, client and knew what was going on within their client and so on. But when you question them more deeply, they really didn't have a, a deep understanding. So often they go to the internet, take things off the internet and put it into the, uh, the working papers and say, well, I know, I know what's going on. Um, so I think there's a couple of things. Uh, number one, I think it is a big research area. I think there's real opportunity for behavioural accounting here to, to extend um, our knowledge and research and to create tools that are important for public and private sector auditors to consider these. Um, but at the end of the day too, I think it's the depth and nuances of the commentary in the audit papers that describe how the organisation operates, that describe the um, inherent risk in relation to the organisation and so on. So I know when I was Auditor General, I knew some people that would put pretty much the same stuff in every audit file, and then some people that would really understand what was going on. And you can see that differentiation in terms of the commentary that's been developed. So one of the things that might be helpful in terms of assessing the application of professional scepticism is actually looking at files prepared by the same auditor across different clients, rather than just looking at one client, if that makes sense. Okay. But I, I, think, there's a, I think there's a lot of work to do to really come to be able to answer that question, because I think that's a really important question. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, next question. Professional skepticism always be required in doing accountant services. The third question, David. Yeah, um, this is a really nice question as well. A really oh, nice good. question. Yeah, yep. <laughs> yep. um, so it, professional skepticism is always required, number one. But number two, and perhaps what I was trying to say, particularly in the earlier part of my presentation is, I can act as a professional skeptic. So I might be auditing your work or I might be managing you or what have you. I need to be professionally skeptic, uh, skeptical to do my job properly. But then if I find something or something doesn't make me comfortable, how I respond to you and how I communicate with you and how we work out the problem together is going to be uh, decide whether or not that professional skepticism causes a problem. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I would argue, yes, you've got to have professional skepticism, but the problem is not caused by the professional skepticism. The problem is caused by how I react when I don't feel comfortable. So if I react by yelling at you, telling you you're a liar or something like that, your response and the, the issues are going to be different to if I go, gee, I, I didn't think this, this doesn't look quite right to me. Can we sit down and work it out? Can you tell me a bit more so that I understand better? So there's two different ways of approaching the problem. And one way is going to create a problem. The other way is going to get the answer. Okay, I think it lies with the how to communicate and the response, right? I think so. Yeah, okay. And the next is what do regulators and oversight bodies of audit firms and those in charge with governance have to play in supporting skeptical behavior among auditors? Yeah, what I think, yeah, it's a really, uh, really good question. So in the Australian context, and I, again, these questions are fantastic questions, a so great opportunity for research. In the Australian context, as um, many people might be aware, if you're a private sector organisation and you require an audit, you must go to um, the market and you select your auditor and then you pay your auditor. If you're public sector, then the Auditor General typically will audit your organisation and you've got no choice. Um, there's a number of things that prevent both sides being perfect in the context of skeptical behaviour. Um, so if I'm an auditor and I am hired by your firm to audit, I want to keep your audit, you as an audit client, because I make money out of it. That's how I make my living. 
So professional skepticism is fine, but there is the, an incentive for me, as you know, to be able to be a bit wary about how I might approach you because I want to keep you as a client. I'm not necessarily going to be as skeptical as I might be, or probably more importantly, and you might change that question. The issue is not so much um, skeptical behavior, but being able to bring that results of that behavior to the fore. Um, in the public sector, government auditors don't have to combat for an audit. They don't have to compete for an audit. And so they can be very lackadaisical in the Australian context as well. They cannot do the work properly. They cannot apply professional skepticism. And so there's incentives always. So in answering that question, and again, I think there's some great opportunity for research there, but in answering that question, it seems to me that you've really got to say, well, at the end of the day, how do you support skeptical behavior? You support it through the way the auditor uh, engages with the client. Um, and for instance, I've been a big supporter and this might, um, might not be attractive to some of your audience, uh, but I've been a big supporter in this country that courts should appoint auditors, not, not um, organizations. So in other words, you should be appointed as an auditor for five years for a particular client. At the end of that five years, you, it's mandatory that you um, don't audit them anymore and a court audit, uh, um, uh, places somebody else in there to audit. That way you don't have that competitive, commercial competitiveness. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, next is about, is it true that professional skepticism can, can be replaced by technology? Thing is well, also about the humanity that you mentioned before. Look, that's my view. My view is that, um, the, you know, if I think back over my career as an auditor, my um, successes were always about my experience and being able to talk to individuals and to see see their express, expressions on their face, um, to be able to see what's, what, what they're hiding. I, I really can't see technology can get, can, can replace that human um, contact. Um, I'm, I'm not a big technologist, so you might know better about what technology might be out there or might be coming. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think that humanity means that humans have got to do the work. Okay. Yeah. Personally, I agree with you. <laughs> okay. Uh, and next is professional skepticism is more about the state in mind. What mm. factors need to be taken into account to translate it effectively into skeptical action? Okay, yeah. From state so, in mind to skeptical action. Yeah. And so again, the behavioral accounting research opportunities here, I, I think are substantial, um, but professional skepticism is more than a state of mind in the sense of how do you train people to be able to react to the skeptical, um, to, their, to, to their thinking in the context of skepticism. Uh, I think that's the important thing. So the factors that need to be put into account to translate it effectively into skeptical action or response rather than action, I think it should be a skeptical response is being able to train people to be able to communicate effectively um, to diminish the opportunity for a poor response from clients or from those people who you are questioning uh, and to get the best possible outcome uh, at the end of the day. Because remembering a lot of people um, might provide bad information or um, do the wrong thing unintentionally as well. So the firm's always done it this way. Um, no one asks me my opinion of what should be done or shouldn't be done. I just do what I'm told to do. Um, so attacking those people is not necessarily gonna get you the, the right outcome either. So I think that there's um, uh, it is more about a state of mind in fact, I would argue, and again, this is research that needs to be done, but I'd actually argue that most people, by the time you're a mid-level manager, um, have sufficient experience to be able to see the, to be able to act skeptically and to see potential problems. What they don't have is the skills that, to then act on that skepticism. And sometimes, particularly in government, it can be more comfortable just simply to ignore it than to act on it. Okay, um, last one is public sector governance is mostly correlated with the political conflict, in your opinion? Yeah. The political yeah. conflict can affect the professional skepticism? Yeah, 
<clears throat> pardon me, this is a really, um, again, a really important issue because, of course, um, both of our nations are democracies and everyone um, gets a vote, uh, all, all uh, adult, um, adults get a vote. If that's the case, then the auditor gets a vote, the auditor general gets a vote, the um, accountants, all of the people that are acting on these things get votes as well. Um, so yes, I think there is, I don't know that it's correlated with political conflict per se, um, but I think the issue is more around how can the public sector um, operate in a political environment is probably the most important question. So for instance, in uh, uh, public sector auditing in Australia, auditors general and their staff never ever comment on policy, ever. They never comment on policy. They might say that the policy was implemented inefficiently. They might say that the policy was implemented ineffectively, but they never say the policy was bad or good because that's actually for the people and the government to decide. If the government says, I want to um, paint every ta every building in Perth red. Um, the governor, the auditor general is not going to say that's a bad policy. What the auditor general is going to be interested in is whether that painting was undertaken in the right colour, as efficiently as possible, as effectively as possible within the time frame. So we're very very keen in Australia, and I think this is probably broadly across the Anglophone world to delineate what it is that people like Auditors General focus on. And policy is never part of that framework ever. Okay. So in other words, is there, uh, you can say there is a limited roles in for auditors in public sector in Australia. They only no. assess the, how the control, is it effective or not? Yeah. Not yeah. to the extent commenting on the policy. No, no. So we, um, none of our, we call them officers of parliament. So that's people like the Auditor General, the Ombudsman, uh, all of these kinds of officers never ever get involved in policy. That's between the government and the people. If the government gets the policy wrong and people didn't want the whole of Perth to be painted red, then they'll vote the government out at the next election. It's not for the Auditor General to say that was good or that was bad. Okay. Okay. Uh, David, is it okay to have two, one or two questions? Because, yeah, of course. Okay. Of course. Uh, this is a question from Bagus. Okay. Yeah. How to maintain skepticism sharp, sharply to detect red flag or fraud scheme? Sorry. Um, I think I need to write down here to everyone can see the question. Yeah. Yeah. Hang on a minute. Okay, uh, we have last questions, two last questions. Yeah. Yes, the first one, how to maintain the skepticism to detect red flag or fraud scheme that mostly hidden. Yeah, so that, that's a really difficult question. I think professional skepticism is, a, uh, is one tool in a toolbox for auditors particularly. And so maintaining that skepticism is really important, but looking at things like that fraud triangle and being able to say, okay, do those components all exist somewhere is a really important issue. To be able to use your professional skepticism to identify where the weaknesses might be in an organization, where the opportunity might be, uh, is a really important part of that professional skepticism process. And then once you've identified where those weaknesses are, you then evaluate the, co the controls that are relevant to those weaknesses, of course, and you might be skeptical that while, uh, for instance, the manager signs approvals, the manager might not even know what they're signing. They might just sign things that are given to them and not investigate that at all. So that's where professional skepticism becomes important. 
being able to interview the manager and to see what kind of process they go through before they sign authorization, for instance, I think is important. Um, okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And last question, we must implement that prudent action if we feel that the sign of fault has been detected and we have the general audit task not investigate what must what we must do well look in i think there's a couple of things that if the sign of fraud's been identified then you've really got an obligation i think to make that known depending on where you sit in your firm up the tree so to speak so do your audit partners or what have you um, if you're in the public sector, then I would always inform the Auditor General, for instance, in my role, um, that the uh, that this uh, fraud has been, uh, or the opportunity for fraud has been identified, and I'd like to investigate that more. I guess, really, at the end of the day, you're then subject, of course, to the Auditor General or to a senior person responding to that, um, and that will give you a bit of a sense of uh, what people think, uh, but I think that's a really important aspect. Okay, um, I think we're approaching the end of our uh, session. Thank you, David, for your kind answer to our questions. It's a very passionate sharing from you. And okay, let me stop the screen. And I will look forward to meeting you again. As you say that you have like a line of discussion in the future. Okay. Yep. And um, I think with that, I can conclude this lecture. But before David, our head of department would like to meet you personally. Of I course. Will yeah, thank you. I will invite you. you to break out room. And thank you. yes, thank you. And everyone, uh, before we before I conclude this lecture, we will have a photo taking uh, for to document this event. Please, everyone, turn on your camera. The committee will take the picture. I think Rehan will take the picture. Rehan, hello. Okay, thank you, Ms. Dina. Uh, dear all participants, please kindly to turn on your camera because we're going to documenting our honorable moment with Professor David. Uh, and please, on three, say accounting, okay? Okay? okay. One, two, three, accounting. Okay. Okay, done. Thank you, Miss Tina. Thank you, Thank you, Ario. And everyone, I also want to remind you we have a feedback survey, and I will appreciate if you could take a few moments to complete the survey to improve our next event. And thank you again, David, for. Bye. My contact Thank details are there, so please um, contact me if you would like to chat any further. I'd be delighted. Yes, of course. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day, and Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Please, committee, uh, invite Prof. David to break out room. Okay, David, are you in your office? Or I am. Are yeah. you on your office? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So the in the, in the university is still online or? Oh, okay. 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 I think okay. he's joining the breakout okay. room. Okay. Thank you, Bu Thank Nadia. You.